Welcome to Rialto Channel's Real Women podcast. I'm Francesca Rudkin. Throughout March and April, Rialto Channel is focusing on female actors and filmmakers who shine the spotlight on the talent and importance of the female perspective in film. In this podcast, local actors and filmmakers share their stories. Today, my guest is Petra Brett Kelly, Sundance Award winning and three times Oscar selected producer, director, and writer. Brett Kelly's award winning films such as Boy Genius, A Flickering Truth, The Art Star and the Sudanese Twins, and Yellow is Forbidden have traveled the world, and she has had films premiere in competition at five of the world's top six film festivals. Last year, she received the inaugural 2019 New Zealand Arts Laureate in Documentary and is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And Petra Brett Kelly joins me now. So lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Now, we have spoken to you at a table. T- I know. Power to us. Looking gorgeous. <laughs> um, love your outfit. Thank you. We've talked several times about particular films that you've, that you've um, shot. We have talked about the awards you've received. We have talked about the festivals you've attended, your films, um, the fact that you're a member of the Academy of Motion Arts and Scientists. I would, in, I see you as one of New Zealand's most acclaimed directors and working on an international stage. What I'm curious to know is, how do you see yourself? <laughs> and that's a really tough question, isn't it? Yeah, and I suppose, you know, it's, it sounds trite to say I don't do it for the awards at all, ever. And in fact, many would, many would kind of go, oh, for God's sakes, but I don't even do it for audiences. You know, I don't, make, I don't think of the audience when I make my film, and I certainly don't think of the awards. But it's important for me to get awards and to be a member of the Academy and to have my films selected for the Oscars to show that, you know, others can get here too. You know, because um, it's a pretty, you know, as you know, it's a bloody tough industry and to be um, a woman, a sole, you know, self-employed, largely self-funded um, and to get fil- make films that resonate internationally, for others to see that is really, really important for me. And it's also important for me that uh, two of my documentaries were selected for Best Foreign Language, which has now, you know, had its name changed, thank God, um, because I also want documentary to be considered as film. And that's also one of my, you know, I'm championing that cause as well. Yeah. So who do you make your films for? Myself, my own curiosity, and that's the honest truth. I just have an idea and I'm so, you know... Um, got too many questions in my head and I love unpredictability I love not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring and I love traveling I love meeting different people and I think life is an adventure and I want to be forever on that adventure so I make it as an excuse for me to then go and hang out in these places and ask lots of questions and be freaking nosy that's it (laughs) it's almost the lifestyle yeah filmmaking fits the lifestyle you want to lead yeah 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 Yeah. this curiosity my parents ingrained in me and bred in me is is the driver that's it so what is the key to finding a story you know I think more and more um, I've just relied on my gut on my instinct and the people that have encouraged me in my career that's where they've been leading me to and I think it was about 10 years ago when I finally realized what they were all shouting at me Um, and that's what I do I just think oh gosh that's a good idea okay if I'm interested in it maybe some others will be interested in it and I really do think I cast I cast people and I cast a situation and and I've been you know fortunate enough that those situations and those people have things have happened you know and that country or that situation has had an international um, story behind it there's something going on there so it, it resonates beyond just you know other filmmakers or my parents um, so that's that's what I do I sort of think oh gosh that's interesting you know I'm making a film in Nigeria at the moment and I didn't realize until I went there because I don't do any research of course I just jump on a plane um, that actually you know half over half the population is under the age of 18 and I'm making a film about these extraordinary kids who are rewriting their own narrative by making the craziest sci-fi films on one shitty cell phone with a cracked screen very little electricity no money they live in this small town on the edge of Boko Haram country where the Muslim north meets the Christian south. So a very kind of conflicted and conflicting kind of town 
on. And within that, these kids are taking the power back and kind of determined to tell their own story. When I got there, I was like, gosh, there's a lot of kids in this. I went to Lagos first. I was like, wow, there are a lot of kids in Nigeria. And then I did a bit of research. And there's all these kids. And then also Nigeria in the next 10 years is going to be one of the 10 most significant economies. Now, I didn't know any of that. But now, you know, because I trusted my gut, that story is an important story within the context internationally of Nigeria within our world. What's it like filming there as a, as a female filmmaker? It's friggin' scary. This is not just as a female. This is as a, as a, a white person. <clears throat> and um, my main question to myself all the time is, what risk am I putting on the kids? Because, you know, as you know, I've been to Libya and Sudan and you know, Afghanistan and other conflict zones. So I'm fine with myself. But if I'm putting somebody else at risk, then that's the issue. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, I handle myself in a particular way. Out comes the headscarf, you know, sometimes I'm in the car filming or I'm in the shed or something. I don't go out in the open as much with the kids as I'd like. Um, and uh, But their families are all behind it and the kids are really behind. I've left a camera with them, so when I'm not there, they film. And they're, they're just magic. Yeah, so it's actually a kind of, I think it's a film we're making together. And I've decided to um, approach the big question of this white woman from first world country coming, you know, and does she really have the right and what story is she telling, by um, commissioning them to make a film on the first day they met me. And I hope they portray me as a, as a monster, you know, as this silly white saviour, because I think that that is... That's really the question. You know, I don't see myself as that, but I think that that's that perception of mm. when you take this looking person mm. into developing countries. You mentioned a little bit earlier on the people who have supported you. Who has supported you, inspired you, mentored you throughout your career? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's... The, it's not necessarily just people who are filmmakers, like Joanna Paul, who's a dear friend and an incredible mentor to me, who knows me personally and professionally, and often will say to me, when she'll look at a cast where I discuss a story with, with her, she'll go, well, of course it's not how I would do it in current affairs, but you need to do it this way. You, your instincts are right. Keep going, keep going. And then Trish Carter, who used to be um, the head of um, TVNZ um, news and she is so she just doesn't hold back and she tells me oh Peter's far too fucking long cut it down cut it down so these those two are, are, are just miracles to me and then I have Molly Malin Stensgaard who's Lars von Trier's editor and she's Danish and she's been a really significant mentor to me now for um, 13 years coming on and I go and I spend time with her in Denmark and we immerse ourselves in my footage and my storylines and she did cut Marty Boy Genius one of my previous films but now I use her more as a um, as my sounding board along the way and she brings a really interesting European sensibility to storytelling um, and for me it's really important not to take on an American sensibility but to have a European sensibility. And you're quite aware of that, that's mm. interesting. Mm. Because I don't, I think um, there are very definite styles of storytelling going on within documentary and what I don't like is too obvious storytelling. I don't like sit down interviews. I don't like voiceover. I like a mystery attached to it. I like the story to, un, to un, unfold and to peel layers back. Just like, that's why I don't do research, because I want to experience the story unfolding too. And that is definitely more European storytelling than New Zealand storytelling. And also, interestingly, Nigerian storytelling. So um, that's how they perceive stories too. And so that's been a really interesting thing for me and I want to kind of read and study and learn more and talk to the kids more about that and, and um, how they are telling stories. Yeah. So you've had the support. How do you pay it forward? I think it's really important to mentor people and I've mentored lots of people over the years and um, I'm currently mentoring nine women around the world and that is so, um, so important because, you know, lots of people have given me breaks, men and women, you know, the poor bastard who was my cinematographer at the start, because I didn't have, there was no film school and I didn't have money, my family didn't have money for me to go away, so overseas, and so, you know, these poor 
DOPs on, you know, shoots that had to really teach me how to do things. So, you know, God bless them. But um, but it's so important to, to show and to, and to pay it forward. And the big thing for me is to not take over their films. And often I'll kind of in my head kind of go, oh, why didn't you understand what I said and do it like I told told you to do? But really, that's not what I'm there for. I'm not to take over and start editing their films or making their films. And they, of course, have their own perspective. And how have you found each other? Um, script to Screen is brilliant. Right. Wift is brilliant. And then I've bumped into people. I once was walking in the Spanish mountains many, many years ago and met this American guy who said he had a friend in Afghanistan who wanted to start to make films. He connected us. I'm still mentoring her. Yesterday I was on a Skype call with her. That's like, you know, 30, 14 years later, I'm still, still mentoring her. Um, these, this Indian couple, um, just people I meet, and I think, yeah, oh, this woman in Sweden, um, this, this other woman in the US, you know, people who I think I've got something to offer them and they might think I have something, you know, to, to give. Um, a, lovely, a lovely couple in South Auckland, I love their work. Um, and yeah, just various people. But I'm also really careful. I don't really, I don't want to mentor men. I'll mentor a couple, but I'm. I think that for me, um, I, it's really important that it's women that I'm encouraging because there's not enough of us that are empowered to tell our stories our way. And I thought, you know, I don't think I want to take the place of a man anymore. I don't think any of us women should think in that way. I think actually, I want to take my place. And I want to do it the female way. And I was recently in a meeting with a funder and I started. I was asking them about what kind of funding, what kind of support are they actually realistically giving female documentary filmmakers? And I started to cry. And this funder said, oh, it's okay to cry. And I was so angry. I thought, of course it's fucking okay to cry. And that I think is what we need to um, take charge of as women, we're more emotional. We do cry, we laugh a lot, we ugly laugh, we feel passionately about things, we do things differently, we're more inclusive. Um, and I'm, so I'm not taking the place of a man, I want to do it the woman's way and have my own place and this is where I stand, not where a man used to stand. And I think that's something that we need to shift towards and mm -hmm. think more strongly about. Um, I don't want to go into a meeting and think I have to hold back Surely passion and emotion makes my films greater. I was just going to say, all, yeah. those, all those attributes that you just mentioned, are they what you believe make you the filmmaker that you are? Yeah. Mm. So why hold them back? Why be embarrassed? Why think, oh my goodness, within a meeting you have to be more like a man and more mm -hmm. staunch. Mm -hmm. And even I said to my lawyer last year, who's a family friend, so he gets me, he said, now, you, you, you've got to not get so emotional. And I was like, no, Willie, I am going to get emotional because that's me, isn't it? And he goes, yes, but sometimes not so good for mediation if you get so emotional. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get emotional. And I think that that's okay. And he, you know, of course, he's so fabulous. You know, he, he works with me. But, um, but I think as women, we need to shift how the business works, how filmmaking works. And because I think, you know, just because a, there's a woman in the room, that doesn't mean you're going to bond with her or she's going to get you or she's going to understand you or she's going to operate in your way. I think all of us need to do it in our way as women. I want to throw up one, one more topic which yeah. might make you cry, and yeah. that is funding. Yeah. Because <laughs> you yeah. are self-funded. Mm. Um, how much of a struggle is that? How, what would you like to see change um, here in New Zealand or internationally that just might make this might make making a film a slightly easier mm. proposal for you mm. I think here in New Zealand I'm really concerned that um, we number of us continue to ask for the stats on because women female filmmakers are you know more in documentary than they are in narrative and that is because we continue to ha have this thing where you, you know, people don't expect a woman can carry a huge budget, but they think a man can. And so we get the smaller budgets and we then revert to documentary where there's smaller budgets. We're more accepted within that framework. And the opportunity for us to work with bigger budgets and narrative is much, much smaller. Then our films don't get the number of screens that male films get, and that's a given. And this might not be a conscious thing by the industry, but it's a fact. This is an international fact. Um, 
And so those things need to change. I'd like to see the statistics. And and I think that's money, not just people go, oh, yes, but we've got a female producer. I'm sorry, but who's the key creatives here? And what money are they getting? I think as um, myself, of course, I take huge risks. And the director and the writer are always the ones who take the huge amount of risks. And the producer can juggle, you know, five or six projects and get some money from all of, all of those. But we take this enormous risk, and yet then we are often paid last. The risk, if it doesn't pay off, we never get the money for that. I think also as people, women who are in the mid or you know you know mid career, there's very little funding for. Okay, we acknowledge you. Um, here's some money to just keep going. There seems to be money for early career and development and kind of you know support at an early stage. But mid-career, it's like, oh, surely you've sorted out your own funding opportunities now. You know, and I get that a lot. Um, so that's, that's just an ongoing struggle. I think a big thing, and I say this to the people I mentor, is be very careful about who you get money from because um, a lot of it comes with strings attached and that can crush your creativity. And if you allow too many voices in your head, like some funders want to then have a say on your structure and your story and your cast and everything and your music and whatever and your editor, those might, it might, you might not come out with your film. And I think that that's a huge, a huge issue. So for me, I think one of the key things is I don't feel the funders are taking risks. I don't think they're entrusting us as risk takers. I think that they are, um, you know, I understand they have their what are they called, KPIs or whatever that term is, um, but they are in the business of supporting risk takers and I feel that they are backing away from that, you know, hugely. Every year I feel it more and more um, and yet they are very quick to to take, you know, if your film's successful, oh gosh, yes, we were on this, you know. So... Um, so I, I don't see funding as getting easier. Um, I never manage to fully fund my films. I have come to the realisation this is a calling, not a career. It's not a business. Um, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of okay with it. Some days I have really tough days where I get really angry because the distributor gets paid and the theatre gets paid and the, and, the, and the funders, they get their weekly wage and then the TV people, they get their wage, you know, and I think, mm, okay, storyteller is at the bottom of the cliff. But, um, but, you know, it's still the most amazing career and, you know, and I love and you're every not single stop. day. I'm not stopping. <laughs> you're not I'm stop. not stopping. <laughs> and I love every day of it. Can you please take care in Nigeria? Yes, I will. Good. I will take care in Nigeria. <laughs> um, I'll take care of the subjects of my film. That's who I'm going to take care of in Nigeria. <laughs> in just a little bit yourself, too. <laughs> a little bit myself. Just a little bit. Yeah. Thank you so much for your oh, time today. Thank you.